It's never wasted time to exalt the name of the one who's done so much for us. This morning, uh, I'm going to start uh, just a very brief two-message series called Full. Uh, a lot of times our calendars feel full and our houses seem full, and maybe even our bellies feel full, especially this Thursday coming up, but sometimes our lives feel empty. And so we're going to look at this concept of, of full in two perspectives. One is uh, the one we're looking at this week is meaningful. And uh, we're in Ecclesiastes, and I have to tell you, this, this passage is, is not the one usually uh, talked about in churches on a Sunday morning. This is what it says, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. How many are already worried about the talk today? You just, where is this going? Well, I, I, I want to give you a fair warning. It gets worse before it gets better, but it does get better, okay? Uh, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil? And uh, look at the last three words. What are they? Under the sun. These three words are the key to understanding everything in this passage. This is the most significant thing for us to grasp, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear uh, its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new, last three words, under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those who will come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are, next word, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Well, you're probably wondering why you came here today. It doesn't sound very encouraging. Who wrote this? And he identifies himself as the son of David, king of Israel, living in Jerusalem. And while he does not give his name, most people believe it was Solomon, one of the wisest and wealthiest kings to ever sit on the throne of Israel. Often when we go to scripture, we look for answers to challenging questions or solutions to difficult problems. And much of scripture is a teaching of that kind. When we come to the book of Ecclesiastes, we're not prepared for the strategy this teacher uses. In fact, if you've ever been in a college class, maybe you had a professor who would make some bombastic and bold statements in order to challenge your thinking. And uh, sometimes they would uh, challenge your thinking in a way that would make you wonder if you really understood what you thought. That's exactly what's happening here. Uh, the teacher is not trying to answer questions. The teacher is trying to provoke questions that will cause you to think through what are the consequences? What are the side effects? What are the outcomes of what it is I believe? And as it turns out, this is a really significant thing. Most people don't think forward on these things. They just think about what makes them feel better or seem safer. And so these set of questions that he's going to drive us to are really big deals. The more life experience, he says, that you have, the more disillusioned and disheartened you will become. 
He starts saying things like this. What do you have to show for all your hard work? What do you have to show? What have you profited? Why did you work so hard? So let me ask this question to you this morning. All right, let's, let's put this scenario out. Let's suppose I came to you after our service today and I said, look, there's something I need from you. I would like you to go to this specific coffee shop on Wednesday between 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd like you to sit inside at the table near the window. So this Wednesday, this coffee shop between 2 and 3 at this table. And the first question anyone would ask is, why? Before you are going to spend an hour of your time and go someplace and sit at a specific table, at a specific location, at a specific time, you would like to know why. So the question I have is, why are we more concerned about how we spend one hour in a coffee shop than how we spend our entire lives? Because many of us never ask the why question for all that we do. Why is that? That's the challenging thing for us. And that's why this teacher, this, this wise man, this wise king forces us into a kind of conversation that many of us are not prepared to have. Animals don't have any sense of the future. You've never seen a cat or a dog with a calendar. It just doesn't work. They only live in the moment. They react by instinct. It's their circumstances that drive their actions. They have no reason to plan, no reason to share, no reason to save. They, if a wolf has an elk, he will eat up to 40 pounds of meat at a single sitting. It never occurs to the wolf, you know, I could eat one pound today and put the this in a safe place where I can eat a pound a day for the next 40 days. They never have that thought because the only thing that matters is right now. And there are lots of people who are choosing to live their lives more like animals than like humans. We need to know meaning. At the end of the day, if our lives are feeling empty, it's usually not because of what we have or don't have. It's because of a sense of worth and value or a lack of it. It's a sense of purpose or a lack of it. So the teacher identifies three ways that our world, everything under the sun, kind of tries to find meaning. And the first is, I am here to make the world a better place. I mean, doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound worthwhile? I am here to make the world a better place. I, when I go, I want to feel like I've made some kind of difference. It's, it's unbearable for us to think that we would live all of our days and it wouldn't count for anything, that it'd be useless and worthless. But the teacher tells us something that uh, astonishes us and it frustrates us. This is what he says. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. So your tribe, your family, your group, whatever that is, eventually they will be gone. The earth will still be here. And then look at what he says here. No one remembers the former generations. Just look at the person next to you. Shake your head in a sad face and tell them, you too will be forgotten. Just to tell them, they're going to forget you. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. There is nothing under the sun that will be remembered. That, that's the key phrase to all of this, under the sun. He's forcing us to think about the limitations that we see, and so he says, if all you do is live to be remembered, you will be forgotten. Somebody said, oh, but if I'm really important, they'll put my name on something. Yes, and they will read that name on whatever building it's on or whatever monument it's on or whatever plaque it's on, but they will not remember you. If something happens to me, it's terrifying how quickly I will be forgotten. And if that is our reason for existence, we're in trouble. If that's what gives meaning to our life, not only will we be forgotten, but everything we have built will disintegrate and it will dissolve, and over time it will become like the, the, the dust of the earth. So if that's where we find our meaning, we're in trouble. So then people say, oh, well, if everything is going to be forgotten, then I've got plan B. 
and plan B is, I am here to enjoy life. All right? We're going to turn this thing into a party. And this is what he says uh, in verse 8. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. So we're just constantly trying to see more and hear more. Verse 17, he says, I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom, but also madness and folly. I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. There are some who've come to the conclusion, if nothing I do matters long term, then I might as well enjoy what I can while I can. And uh, it, once you realize I will be forgotten and nothing I do will last, then the only thing left is to distract yourself and to medicate yourself. Here's the challenge, is once you take on that mindset, you lose not only your own moral compass, but you lose your right to speak morally into anything in the culture. Because now it's just, well, whatever makes you feel better. And this is important. Under this model, thinking is not good. Only feeling is good. I just have to feel good. That's the only thing that works. So there's a pursuit of happiness. Here's the problem. Happiness, when you pursue it, is unachievable. It doesn't work. Every time you try to grasp it and grab it and aim for it and tackle it, you miss it every time. Happiness is always a byproduct of something else we were doing. But in our world, this is what we do. If we enjoy something that's never enough, we never think, oh, that was a wonderful meal. What do we think? I've got to go back to that restaurant every Friday for the rest of my life. We, we can't just enjoy something. We have to own it. We can't just enjoy something. We have to build our lives around it. And that becomes a problem. And we wind up choosing, pursuing a happy life as opposed to a meaningful life. In a meaningful life, it's entirely possible that you will experience some pain, some sadness, some sorrow, some disappointment. But in a meaningful life, you will also have joy and satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment. If you pursue a happy life, you will never be happy. And by the way, everyone around you won't be either. But if you pursue a meaningful life, that could be very different. If we pursue a happy life, the only lifestyle left for us is the lifestyle of addiction. I have to have that. I have to have that more. I have to have that more frequently. And now our life becomes all about whatever that is. And so our, this is the option. If, if life is pointless and meaningless, I better medicate myself. And our culture has learned the horrible secret. We can turn anything into an addiction. There's another uh, way people try to grasp meaning under the sun, and that is, I am here to justify my existence. I'm going to prove that I belong here and that I deserve to be here while others may not. And that's the key to understanding this. This is what he says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new there's the phrase again, under the sun. So since there's nothing new and I'm here, what are my options? He says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. So I can't really fix anything, but I can separate myself from something I think is less. And so now I have to prove not that I'm just getting better, but that I'm better than you. Isn't that what happens? You know, has, don't... I'm, I'm sure no one here has ever done this, but we all know people who have. Where you went on a diet of some sort, and you said things like this. After you got rid of all the whatever it is you were, all your carbs or all your gluten or all your whatever, and, and you said things like this. this. This is great. I feel so fantastic. I can't believe I ate all that junk before. This is changing my life. 30 days later, you're back in all that stuff again. <laughs> Do you know why? Because it didn't change your life. But for that 30 days that you're committed to this program, or maybe you have a really strong will and you want 60 days or 90 days or whatever it is, have you ever noticed how people act around other people who are eating all the stuff that we used to eat? And there's just this little little tone of moral superiority. Anybody notice? 
I was in a meeting, and I had to have a meeting on a regular basis, and there was a person who was in that meeting that was always there, and they were a vegan. Now, this is not a comment against vegans. It's just about a conversation I had with one, because vegans are humans too. Okay? <laughs> and so, so this is what they told me. They said, vegans live longer. I said, no, they don't. Oh, they said, oh, yes, they do. I said, no, it just seems longer, because you don't get to enjoy any food. <laughs> That's how that works. It's not the same. See? As soon as we feel like we're proving we're getting better, that's never enough for us. Now we have to distinguish ourselves from other people who aren't doing that. And now it's us and them. And this always goes badly in our world. Why is it we have a hard time just maybe trying to get a little bit better without trying to feel better than someone else? And where did this idea come from anyway that we could actually get better? Isn't it interesting? There's never been a single tribe, a single country, a single state, a single city, a single town, a single village, a single home where there was never any lying, where everybody always told the truth, where no one ever acted out in anger, where there was never an example of violence, where everyone spoke with kindness and always was generous with whatever they had. That society has never ever existed on the face of this planet. So why do we think it's even possible, much less why do we think it's even good? We've never seen it. Why do we even try for that stuff? It, it's a challenge to us. And we're, we're struck with this, it's constant reminder. He keeps, he keeps dropping the little phrase in, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. If all there is is what we see under the sun, then your origin is insignificant. Then your destiny is insignificant. And if your origin is insignificant and your destiny is insignificant, guess what everything else is in the middle too? It's insignificant. And this is what the teacher tries to drive us to. He forces us to start contending with these things. Our lives don't have to be empty. They can be full, and they can be full of meaning. But how do you find these mean this meaning? And the first thing I would encourage you to do, take steps of faith. Take steps of faith. If there is something more than just what you can see under the sun, wouldn't that matter a lot? Wouldn't that be important? Couldn't that mean that maybe our interactions, if there's something more than what we see, if there's something more than what's under the sun, isn't it possible that then lots of things mean a lot more than we can imagine they do? Here's the challenge, is that when it comes to thinking about things like God and his existence and how can we know him and, 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 and how do we interact with him, uh, this is what happens. A lot of people will say, well, when you prove the existence of God to me, then I'll, I'll take some steps on that. Here's the challenge. It's not how it works. By the way, it's not how anything works. But hiding in doubt only paralyzes you. If God were real and heaven were real and grace were real and you were an eternal being and every person you met was an eternal being, wouldn't you want to know that? Do you think that you can honestly discover that truth through passivity and indifference? Why not bring some curiosity to the game? Why not be willing to try an experiment? Why not start a conversation with the one you're not even sure is really there? I've heard lots of stories that began their spiritual journey just that way. This was their first conversation to God. It started like this. I don't even know if you're real. But, just in case... And there are some people who consider it some kind of intellectual suicide to even dare to risk the curious conversation with someone that you've not yet proven exists. And what God says, until you are willing to take a step of faith, you will not see in this place what you could not see in that place. We have to be, Jesus said this, didn't he? He didn't say, watch me. He said, follow me. These are steps of faith. Maybe a step of faith is to actually start doing some research into Scripture to find out what kind of wisdom is contained in it and if it would be beneficial to us. Maybe part of a step of faith would be connecting with a community of faith and having conversations about something other than pop culture and politics and the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> meaningless, meaningless. It's, 
It's all meaningless. No, this is not a reaction to their last game. They're just the perfect illustration of it. It's all community. God doesn't just call us to take steps of faith. He takes them. He sent his son to show us what his heart is like. And his son paid the price so that all of our shortcomings could be taken care of. And there was no guarantee that anyone would listen or that anyone would love in return or that anyone would follow him. God came into our world on a rescue mission, not a military raid. He did not come and hold us all at some kind of eternal gunpoint and require us to say certain words. He didn't overpower us. He took a step of faith towards us, and we can do the same towards him. Meaning is found when you're willing to take a step of faith. Second thing is we can bring order to chaos. You and I are actually called to do this. It's one of the very first things we see in Scripture is that the Bible tells us that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Everything was in total chaos and God moves in and begins to bring order. Our world is filled with chaos and it seems to be getting even more chaotic. I don't think that's just an opinion of a guy who's getting older. I hear a lot of other people, and a lot younger than me, saying the same things. It seems as though our, our news feed is dominated with chaos, and our homes are dominated or infiltrated with chaos. Disease is a chaos that damages our body, and violence is a chaos that damages other people. And so what we do is we develop a way to try to brace ourselves against it, and it's called pessimism. How many here have ever been to a dentist? How many here have ever been to a dentist and they touched something in your mouth that woke you up? You ever had that experience? I have. And you know what I find myself doing? I'll go into the dentist and I'll sit in the chair, which is a reasonably comfortable chair, but moment by moment, my muscles become more tense and rigid. And I find myself like this all tightened up. What, why am I like that? Why do I do that? Because I believe I'm going to be hurt. <laughs> I believe something else. I believe that tightening my muscles will actually reduce the pain. Does it really? No. Why can't I just sit there and relax? Because I'm a pessimist when I'm in the dentist's office. That's why. That's why. And this is how we respond to life. We brace ourselves for the chaos that we think is unavoidable. And maybe part of our steps of faith is not about bracing ourselves for chaos that we can't stop, but entering into chaotic situations and bringing the order of God's kingdom into it. Maybe that's what we're here to do. Grace is God's order. It does far more than just forgive a person of something they've done. It actually transforms a life back to their intended purpose. They've been rescued. And I will tell you, it takes a fair amount of courage to face and step into chaos. But that's how light gets shined in darkness. And that's how boundaries get established that are wholesome and healthy. And that's how we walk into situations that are barren and in a wilderness and see something that is fruitful and flourishing come out of it. It's not enough to rail against the night, be a light. And the only way we can do that is that's how we bring order to chaos. Complaint is the mother tongue of chaos, and our world is filled full of that native language. Praise, hope, faith. This is the language of God's kingdom, and it's how we bring order to a chaotic world. One last point on how to bring meaning, and that is live for something greater than yourself. Live for something greater than yourself. Give, your something, give yourself to something that lasts longer than the sun. If all we do is give ourselves to what is under the sun, Eventually, it will die out, it will burn out, it will rust out. It's when we actually serve someone or something other than ourselves, greater than ourselves, that we get a sense of, of value and meaning. This is a fascinating thing to me. I'm sure uh, most everyone in this room has had a moment like this, where you were doing something for someone or something else, and for just even if it was a brief moment, you actually forgot yourself for a minute. It didn't matter what other people thought. 
It didn't matter how you looked. It didn't matter what their opinion was because you were doing something that mattered. Our constant self-evaluation, wondering if we're measuring up, is evidence that we are pursuing a life that doesn't matter. And when you're doing something that really matters, it's not like you have to tell yourself, don't think about yourself. When you do something that really matters, you just don't. It just, it makes that much of a difference. We can become involved in something that's so great and so grand and so glorious that we actually don't think as much about ourselves. And it's only when we give ourselves to something that will last longer than the sun that we escape this meaningless trap in life. When we learn to see, just imagine this, what if, what if the person sitting next to you will live longer than the sun will shine? What if our final goodbyes that we say here in services that draw tears from our eyes, what if that's just a temporary, temporary situation and we'll be reunited again? What if the greatest forces of the universe are not destruction and fear and terror, but what if it is grace and wisdom and truth? And if those things are true, then every single person we come in contact with has meaning and value. And every single thing we do can have purpose. And that's how we escape the meaningless trap. And that's how our lives become full of meaning. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, I guess the question I would have is, are you willing to take a step of faith? For some of us, that might be a first step, that, that first conversation that we haven't had yet. And uh, I'll tell you, it takes courage. People will argue that it just takes maybe less intelligence to start a conversation with someone you don't know if they exist or not. I, I think it just takes courage. And I think that that can be the beginning step Maybe you could say at some point today, God, I don't even know if you're real. But I want to start a conversation. I've come to the place where there has to be more than what I see. I'm running out of answers and I'm running out of energy to keep pursuing things that don't seem to matter to me as much anymore. I need a reason to get up in the morning. I need a better reason for the work that I do. And I need to see people as something other than exposable, disposable commodities whose only purpose is to help me get what I want. There is something beyond the sun. God has come. He's invaded our chaotic and broken world. And he tells us it can all change. And you can find the purpose you were created for. You can see the value in yourself and others if you look beyond the sun. So, Father, help us with that today. This does not come easy to us. And for some of us, it doesn't feel natural. But help us understand it is supernatural. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.